Welcome to Green and Red, Scrappy Politics for Scrappy People, a regular podcast on radical environmental and anti capitalist politics. Brought to you by Bob Bazanka and Scott Park. to the silky smooth sounds of the green and red podcast i'm your co-host scott parkin in berkeley california today bob is off on assignment but you got me and we're back bob and i are coming back after a little bit of a summer break you'll be seeing a lot more shows from us in the coming weeks and months but today we're going to be talking about a couple of things that we really like to talk about in the green and red podcast it will be a little bit of history and u.s foreign relations and movement organizing, and then also people who are fighting back against corporations, which is ties in with those other two. And so joining me to talk about that is actually my longtime friend, David Gilbert. David, welcome to the Green and Red podcast. It's good to be with you. Yep. And David is an environmental anthropologist with special interests in social movements, ecological change, and post-development theory. He is a uh, postdoc research fellow at the Institute of Environmental Science and Technology at the Autonomous University of Barcelona, uh, and he's held previous positions at UC Berkeley, and he holds a PhD from in anthropology from Stanford. And David is also, this is how David and I go back, is active in protest movements across four continents, from Sumatra and Amazonia to Catalonia and California. And then David is also the author of a new book that we're going to be talking about today, which is, you can't see it because of the blur if you're on video, but it's called Countering Dispossession, Reclaiming Land, a Social Movement Ethnography. And so this book actually talks a lot about a, a community in Indonesia uh, called Cassia Vera. And two decades ago, a group of Indonesian agricultural workers began occupying the agribusiness plantation near their homes. In the years since, members of this movement have reclaimed collective control of their land and cultivated diverse agricultural force on it, repairing the damage done over nearly a century of abuse. And the book kind of details that story. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit. But David, actually, before we get into some specifics around Cassia Vera, in your title, it's Countering Dispossession, Reclaiming Land. And so two sort of themes uh, of the book are dispossession and reclaiming. And so maybe we could just start off with a sort of like brief description of what each of those mean. Yeah, no doubt. Thanks, Scott, for getting us started. Dispossession is, in Marxist terms, the original theft of land from peasant people, from farmer folk, from even from urban dwellers, that or original theft of land to allow ca capitalism and the capitalist class to exist at all. And as we understand it now, dispossession is not just a one-time deal. Dispossession has been happening now for hundreds of years, if not thousands, right? And capitalist dispossession going for a few hundred and still continuing today. So yeah, dispossession now is can be thought of broadly as the loss of life ways, culture, so social cohesion all the way down to the most like material Marxist ways of thinking about it, which is the land and other productive resources that we have on planet Earth. And reclaiming now is a, a, a potentially emancipatory phenomenon and concept that now exists str most strongly through the land back movement, right? Um, social movements that are seeking to get back all that's been lost to capitalism, all that's been lost to the exploitation of the land, the contamination and pollution of it. So reclaiming is taking a really strong environmental aspect these days. But yeah, in, in, right now, reclaiming is, is a word that we're hearing all the way from actually Kamala Harris was mentioning it yesterday, reclaiming in the context of, of a certain type of economy or well-being in the U.S. sense. And all the way to where I've been working most closely in Amazonia and Indonesia, where my 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 last my my first book and most recent publication is focusing in on. And there the land aspect or the agrarian aspect is it continues to be like the main one. And I really pick up the threads of this story. Reclaiming goes as far back as dispossession goes. And 
Mm -hmm. I really hone in on a special period at the fall of the New Order in Suharto and in, in the 1990s where archipelago-wide reclaiming movement emerged. And that was bound up in farmers' rights, peasants' rights, food sovereignty, just freedom and concepts of democracy and being free of dictatorship and imperialism. And it is now continuing on really closely linked to the land back movement here in the U.S., in Amazonia, Brazil, Canada, First Nations movements. But yeah, those two words are how I kind of my thoughts around these issues that are unfolding all, all over with social movements. And what is Cassia Vera and how does dispossession and reclaiming apply? And just to give the audience a little bit of a, a brief background on the on what has happened there. Yeah, I first came to learn of the community of Cassio Vera in Sumatra, um, the largest island in Indonesia, and, and the original place where the plantation economy, the colonial plantation economy really took hold with like tobacco, rubber, and now palm oil being the, the main ones. And there in Cassio Vera, their land became one of these plantations. In this context, it was mostly a tobacco plantation. Also, they did some kind of industrial livestock grazing there. And also raising ginger, another commodity crop that was sold like mostly to the east. But yeah, the, the people of Casio Vera suffered these dispossessions not once, but like multiple times throughout colonial history with the Dutch. The, their land was cr created in, uh, in a plantation in what was called a concession, like a land lease, which now still is like a really important to topic to understand like land struggles across the world. And agribusiness companies from Europe started, yeah, logging, grazing, raising um, these plantation crops on. And eventually the people of Casio Vera, as they called themselves, were basically coolies working their own land for a colonial agribusiness plantation. And then they, they were able to briefly get their land back, basically because the company abandoned it when the Japanese invaded Sumatra at the end of World War II and basically stole it from the Allies. And then the, the Japanese retreated. And boom, came the, the new order with Major General Suharto in 1960, 1967, this genocidal regime. And mm -hmm. one of the first things they did was grab Cassio Vera's land back, this beautiful shoulder of this, it's like this beautiful, flat, super rich volcanic um, shoulder to a, a volcano with cloud forests above it. But it, it it's clo close to Padang, one of the, the major kind of ports of the world to, to this day. So it's just an incredibly valuable site. So yeah, this the new order took it right back. Again, put a retired army general in charge of it. And that was, that was tooling, right? Yeah, exactly. And they con converted to an industrial plantation and, and cattle operation yet again. And that, that went on for some 30 years until finally the people of Casio Vera refused to live with this like impossible condition of being dispossessed from their own homelands, they never forgot. And we see that everywhere today. Of course, Palestine being the clearest example. And they took it back. They used direct action. They used protests. They used blockades multiple times. And then for them, it that was almost two decades ago when the Suharto's regime was weakening. The new order was starting to fracture. This reclaiming movement started bubbling up across the archipelago. And then for them, it became a question of how to hold on to the land and how to make it economically useful for them and socially important, which they've done. And for me, that's really one of the most remarkable parts of the Casio Vera story. I came to learn about them through the umbrella organization Via Campesina, one of the largest peasant umbrella organizations, if not the largest in the world. And they decided to come celebrate Casio Vera with a major summit where people from over 40 nations arrived, and myself included. And the, re the reason why they really wanted to uphold and like honor that site is like through like incredible incredible hardship. They, they took on a, a dictator, a, vi a violent regime, a military regime, got their land back, and then figured out how to make it productive using natural farming methods like agroecology, really no industrial fertilizers, no pesticides, and also did it in a way that wasn't really capitalist at all, actually. They really decommodified the land and decommodified the labor, the, the people that were working it from Casio Vera. And so really they're leading a way forward, like beyond all these problems with industrial agriculture, we have environmental, mm -hmm. social problems. Yeah, they've they've now, of course, it it's not a perfect place and, and they have an ongoing struggle in, in many ways, both economically, socially, politically. But we have a lot we have a lot to think through and think with Cassio Vera and also like to just build with in terms of like fundamental organizing, protest strategy, all that stuff. 
they're linked up through the Indonesian Peasant Union, just one of like many really active kind of agrarian groups, which are now building more and more alliances with like urban land groups, like reclaiming the block and like reclaiming neighborhoods. And those those like really just concrete, like day-to-day solidarities are out there for us to appreciate and work on for sure. Did we see, did the Cassiavera model of the 96, they begin to occupy their land, which leads to this transition. It's also around the time of the fall of the Saharto regime, which I think was like 98, right? Did this model catch on anywhere else, at least in Indonesia, if not anywhere else globally? Oh, yeah. The reclaiming movement, when we talk about it, it can mean many things at many different scales across the world. But Casiavera's movement was most directly linked up with the West Sumatran Peasant Union. At the time, they were still all underground. This type of organizing was absolutely forbidden. And not only was it forbidden, there was a pervasive sphere of surveillance. The New Order was one of the world's most sophisticated surveillance states. And so they were meeting underground in quiet places, usually movement members' homes out in their rice paddies to organize, to link up. And then by 98, there we have some a few hundred cases documented across Indonesia, similar reclaiming. And one of the first social movement books that was published at the fall of the New Order was a book by a group of land activists talking about the Gerakan Reklam or the re- reclaiming movement of Indonesia. So that really signaled a whole new era of how people are going to relate to the land. And like many revolutionary movements, not everything at that moment came to fruition. And, and if anything, we've seen like the real consolidation of a new like capitalist oligarchy that has some really strong roots in the new order. Of course, we have Prabowo now. Suharto is one of Suharto's right-hand mans and now literal in-law who, who was once directing special forces in Indonesia to quell... In East Timor, right? In East Timor, Aceh, Papua, all these freedom movements of which the reclaiming movement is the strongest and most numerous and like tr- tr- continuing this tradition of peasant movements from the 1960s on. Of course, Indonesia was wiped out, almost completely dismantled during the new order, but now we have the reclaiming movement and just agrarian movement more generally, our envir- environmental movement, indigenous rights movements. All of these movements have really flourished since the late 90s in Indonesia, and they are really changing the, the political script in many, many ways. So yeah, and then of course, they link up with like other reclaiming movements. I had the pleasure to spend time with some Indonesian movement union, union leaders that have spent a lot of time in Brazil with the MST um, the Land- Landless Laborers Union. And, and so th- that's one of the most closely allied groups. Of course, the other groups through Via Campesina, there's a lot of organizing that you can think of components of what they're doing as a reclaiming movement or all of it. I think Via Campesina most clearly talks about food sovereignty, this concept of produce your food how you want with freedom in, in the ways that you choose with, that aren't generally like explicitly capitalist or at least not industrial agribusiness oriented. So yeah, the reclaiming movement exists within that and also has some links out, as I said, into housing justice, occupying and squatting urban areas and cities and in Indonesia. And we see that really strong in, in Europe and in Latin America. Yeah, so there's some really exciting, yeah, like links of solidarity to explore through Cassie. One thing that kind of came out to me in your book is we have this authoritarian regime, which was Saharto, which ruled Indonesia for 30 plus years. And then he... As with the example of Cassiavera, he gives land that are profit making to his people and yeah, cronies. Yeah, cronies. his cronies, crony, his cronies. <laughs> but but then there's also like a corporate element here, and it's it, I mean there, I know that there's native indigenous corporations, but then there's also you know multinational corporations which are also wanting some of these commodities you talked about, like logging and palm oil and coffee and and tobacco, et cetera. And I'm curious in this sort of, in this sort of environment, the, because you, and you touched on this before, is that the people of Casiavera, I I assume before they did their, started their occupation in the 96 have been organizing for a long time. We're like, we know the Zapatistas in in Chiapas organized for 20 years before they had their uprising in 93. But what did some of the organizing that led up to what happens in 96 and the late 90s and forward look like, particularly under this authoritarian regime that was like very much like corporate controlled. Yeah, it's so critical for us to understand these histories and just we refuse to repeat them. It does feel like the cold winds of fascism are blowing across the world in a way that they haven't maybe in a long time, especially with some of the armed conflicts that we're seeing right now. And it's really remarkable 
Yeah, as I said, just starting with people talk about their starting with just linking up and speaking to each other in private places where they felt like they could express some of their ideas and thoughts. That was the basis. And they did that for a very long time, for years. And then really getting a sense of where the institutional limits are. So like Casio Vera had a real underground component and they also used it like a, a local, like in, we could think of it as equivalent of a municipalist form of government. In that case, it was what they call like a customary council kind of a indigenous indigenous form of governance that exists as a legal part of the state mm -hmm. and our equivalent here in the bay would be like the county supervisors right they mm -hmm. started recruiting and like having these conversations with some people that were in power and in this case in Casiavera many of those people understood that this was the people's land including some of their own they were some of the like local elites often the the new order regime would put javanese people in the top post everywhere in the country to really enforce this concrete like flume of ideological thought that was like the militarized new order. But there were always some local people in the mix. So they started recruiting, having conversations with them. And eventually they felt like they had a bit of support through this council. And finally, the council themselves started writing some very polite bureaucratic letters to the rest of the new order to try to push their issue. So there was this really pragmatic and interesting seeing what you could literally like what type of tunnel you could ch chisel out of this really dangerous violent bureaucracy they even like flipped a really uh, important officer for the intelligence agencies in the local area that was like really scary this office was basically in charge with finding any dissent immediately uh, arresting and detaining them and shipping them off like thousands of miles if not to their death if not killing people outright they mm -hmm. even like, were able to like use some there just this local understanding of the issue and elicit support that way and once they were in that position then they felt like they could start becoming a little bit more brazen and using like tactics like blockades aids are really dangerous just going and sitting down on a road to block like bulldozers for example or in this case Casiovera's residents blocked the plant main plantation access road a technique we see across across indonesia and around anywhere there's the plantation economy, we see this like really effective blockading kind of ch choke point. It's also a really dangerous technique because you're just sitting there waiting. And if there's armed violent response, either from like the paramilitaries that are really active in, in Indonesia and Sumatra, the plantation paramilitaries or like the actual state. But in this case, they were with a great amount of, of bravery. They called the army's bluff and like the army did stand down and, and didn't fire on, on them. Was that a result of politically Saharto's iron grip beginning to dissolve, fall apart. It was, and it was very much about that time where the dual function of the military is, had been questioned. The dual function in the sense of it's, it's supposed to inf protect the nation's borders and enforce rule amongst its own population. And <laughs> people really started questioning that after just like the great toll of like possibly a million dead or more like in this gulag. And that the, the army was really running. And so as the dual function of the army was questioned, you had these cases where the army would respond and they would stand down and they wouldn't use their weapons. More and more, the people demanded that and the army itself was realized things had gone too far. And it's a really important lesson, I think, as we stand just a few days ago, Trump is talking about using the military within his own nation. And as hard as that is to imagine here, obviously, colonialism, imperialism, it's always used that tactic, that dual function of the army. And what are the ways that you can attack it as an unarmed movement? Castellar is a completely unarmed movement. And, and it, it really is like trying to question that moral authority of people using <laughs> violence against your own people. And, and in that sense, Castellar had a had an advantage of being like considered like the majority mainstream identity, ethnicity, indigeneity of the place, it, it would have been even much more difficult if they were considered like the, a minority ethnicity or identity or indigeneity in the place. And, you know, that there's some really important things we think we need to think through in the U.S. too about that and about how the, the importance of having white people in the U.S. context putting their bodies on the line because white people, myself amongst them, might have a better chance of getting the white racist cops to stand down without killing everyone if they're faced with white bodies instead of brown and black and other in, in diverse bodies in our context. 
But yeah, that was a really important lesson. It was like the mainstream majority peasant movement was actually allow, able to appeal to, hey, Indonesia is an agrarian nation. You should really be supporting us peasant people, us like mainstream Cascavera people. But of course, it took that real contentious like activism nonetheless. And mm -hmm. it's, that's really been ongoing. And to this day, they don't actually have legal right to their land back. They, to the day, it's just a de facto control of the land. And that's yet another thing we should think with about the importance of defying the law and the importance of organizing in a way that doesn't build ethno states. It, and in fact, it dismantles them, but it, it returns control to, of the land and the resources of a nation to the people that actually use them and where they live and, and empower them to make these decisions. Casiobera has been able to actually create like a form of land control, a, a way of using the land, enforcing it, it, enforcing like certain ecological aspects of use of the land, also other social ones. You're not allowed to buy and sell the land at all. Mm -hmm. these, these are things that are becoming really important in the land back movement now that like places like the Segura Land Trust in the Bay, they're starting to get back to reclaim like a lot of land. And now like a whole nother level of considerations arises about like how you're going to use that, like what type of solidarity economy does the land sustain? And Casio Vera has had to really grapple with those questions for two decades. Now, the the company that, that has the sort of more official state, state officials ownership of the land, I blanked on the word there for a second, uh, is called Dona. And how have they, what is, how have they responded to this? And this has gone on for, going on 30 years. And so what is the sort of how did they respond to it initially? And then also, what is the current state of affairs with them? Yeah, the Dona Plantation Company was just one of like hundreds of plantation companies that exist in Indonesia. And some of the largest are like Wilmar. Cargill actually doesn't own plantations outright anymore. Back when we were working together with... Car Rainforest Cargill Island. for the audience being a US-based company. FYI. Yeah, US-based company. Maybe the largest company you've never heard of, Cargill still almost completely family owned the largest agribusiness company in the world at the back when we were working on this issue around oil palm they did own plantations outright in indonesia or at least they had the concession lease rights for 99 years from the government that's the way these plantations work um, with agribusiness they also lease the land they lease the land for basically nothing from the government and then can log and plant industrial crops to their heart's content you know Cargill, they, they actually sold their plantations while we were campaigning against them. So they could like basically launder oil palm, say, oh no, it's environmental stuff. And now they just ship it around the world and they sell it, they refine it. They, it's a billion dollar industry for them, but they say they don't produce any of the oil palm that's destroying forests and exploit, exploiting workers. Um, but yeah, to answer your, your questions more about kind of the dynamics around corporate control, the responses really do range from a company that's concerned about its public image and does a lot to manage that and manage some of the risks with producing some of these commodities, like destro destroying like vital orangutan and rhinoceros ha habitat or using slave or child labor. All of these problems have been well documented in the industrial agriculture sector across the world and of course in Sumatra. And then there's companies like the Dona Plantation Company, or maybe like a Duta Palma that I also ran has campaigned with, and I continue to follow, both of which are owned by retired or in the case of some of the, these companies, even active military, usually quite high up generals or lieutenant generals. These companies seem to care very little about things like that. And it wasn't, there wasn't a lot to be gained for Casavera to run like a public media campaign where they were campaigning around the commodity chain of oil palm in general. So really, they spent a lot more of their efforts with other parts of the government trying to delegitimize. Over time, I, I was given this incredible gift of an archive of the land struggle from Cassio Vera after mm -hmm. there's basically no records left in the government offices for whatever reason. And it showed over time the movement really creating a sophisticated understanding of like land law, agrarian law, having all the history of the land over like many hundreds of years, like documented and using a lot of the kind of ir irregularities. The plantation leases in Indonesia, often the borders don't match up with anything in real life that are given in the lease. Mm -hmm. And so they attack that. And the responses fr from the company, then like from a company, you have to be quite concerned with Don Adona or Aduta Palma. 
because they don't seem to care much about the international market or their image. So often militarized violent response happens, both through paramilitaries. Mm -hmm. I've, worked, I've done some specific work on this these paramilitaries that are really associated with this like really terrible trilogy of like police, military, and governors and the, the executive branch of the government, um, many of whom sit on the board of these paramilitaries that are really designed to enforce the dispossession of plantation lands peoples and maintain it. Dona was lucky they faced that, but there were there was only one, I think, lot, one person was killed in their struggle and maybe a few other like really contained small acts of violence. Mm -hmm. But they were fortunate, like most places in the reclaiming movement have been fully dismantled. I visited many that have been completely repressed, arrests, dismantlings, really chilling assassinations have happened. They're not super common, not on the scale of somewhere right now, like Honduras or Guatemala. But of course, we understand being like a land and water defender is like one of the most dangerous things you can be today in our capitalist world and our capitalist planet. We did a show with a land defender from the Philippines. He's actually American, but he was doing land defense work with people in the Philippines. And a number of his comrades were killed and he was actually shot and paralyzed from like the neck down um, randomly, yeah, which is a, one of the very brutal plays. And it, it really has to be like part of the considerations of doing this work and organizing. Like, how do we make these places just safer? How do we take arms out of the equation? Indonesia is very fortunate. They have very strong gun control laws that are enforced in Indonesia. Of course, it's terrible that the military and uh, other groups have access to weapons and do terrible things with them. But on the whole, there, there's not this saturation of arms in the society like there is in the Philippines. It does make things, in my analysis, much more dangerous. Colombia, South America, that what's happening in Ecuador right now is like really tragic, where it's like this safe country with so many activists struggling so strong for the rights of all living beings in the world, for indigenous rights. Now their security situation has now become so dire that the forms of organizing we're doing there need to be like just expert level um, security culture stuff. We need to really push all of our movements to get better at that. Um, it's yeah. just another shout out because I always like to reference our other episodes. We actually just did an episode with a, a Colombian union, a trade unionist who actually had to flee Colombia because he was under death threat from right wing paramilitaries. I followed that one. Yeah, that was such a moving story and show and like just the struggle there is so real. And as it is in Indonesia, uh, I'll never forget like watching um, two like movement activists just be disappeared um, into an unmarked vehicle. And at that moment, like every possible like eventuality was running through my head and it turned out it was it was the police and they, they were booked and arrested and tried and Eventually, one of them was convicted and the other, I think, was ruled not guilty in creating like a legal land reclamation area where they had over 100 families living in an old, abandoned, basically fundamentally, it used to be indigenous lands. And now for almost 50 years, it was an industrial logging concession and then kind of left abandoned. And they moved in and created a, a quite a remarkable, thriving like forest community. And then permission was given to a new as far as I understood, European-owned conglomerate to to mostly do industrial agriculture on. And, and at that point, the enforcement came. It was just one of those places I was involved with where you, you have to be so careful. And you always have to be asking yourself, either as like a scholar activist or an organizer, like, what is my presence doing here? Is it helping? Is it hurting? Do I understand my presence? What are the risks for everyone involved, not just myself? So like in that case, like I decided to bounce out of there. I, did, I think I'm more comfortable with that. And uh, yeah. You know, this is maybe a good segue for the uh, next sort of thing I wanted to talk about, talking about the Philippines and Colombia and, and Indonesia, which are all authoritarian, in my estimation, authoritarian regimes that are backed by the U.S. And so there's actually a long history of the U.S. going back to Saharto, the U.S. backing the regime in Indonesia, the new order. And I think it was in... You talk about it in your book. I also read it in the Jakarta Method by Vincent Bevins. Is he talks a lot about how it was some of it was like early surveillance state about how they were able to actually they were actually able to monitor the movements the in, in Indonesia was the Indonesian communist movement, but also peasant movements and land defenders and things like that, going back to the 50s and 60s. Uh, I, I believe they actually call it in, uh, I didn't know this until I read your book, but the Gestapo. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could actually talk a little bit about 
how U.S. foreign policy apparatus, intelligence apparatus, military apparatus actually played a role in, in some of what we're talking about. Yeah, no doubt. We always need to... The, C- the CIA, basically, if people are wondering what I mean by intelligence apparatus. Yeah, the CIA. And right at the formation of the CIA, like coming out of, of course, like we had the McCarthy era and the specter of big C communism, right, across geopolitical blocks. And Indonesia was had the largest communist party outside of Russia and China. So they were really like number three concern of the U.S. with it was like over a million members, right? Yeah, over a million members um, of a basically a completely um, nonviolent um, political movement um, that aligned itself with the USSR and the People's Republic of China, at, which at that point by like the late fifties had really solidified into in true geopolitical counterpoints to like Western imperialist power. Right? We all understand that history, and Indonesia's role in it is often very much. Uh, oh, overlooked. And part of that is because of how poorly understood it is by historians to this day. In my book, I present some original research from the CIA's own archive, also from the Hoover Institution at Stanford. That's basically a research arm of the intelligence community or the geopolitical, political science, war hawk community these days and has been basically from the start. And still, there's so much we don't understand. But what, what we do understand is that um, yeah, the CIA was basically formed at the same time um, that U.S. foreign policy identified Indonesia as even at the time in the late 50s, more important than Vietnam or Cambodia or, or than Laos, uh, more important um, to stop that domino from falling. And that led to a lot of really early CIA intervention, covert wars and other forms of intervention and control and influence wielding in Southeast Asia as a whole. And and to go back all the way to the Cassiovera story, unbeknownst to the people of Cassiovera, right around the end of the Japanese occupation of World War II, shortly thereafter, the CIA and uh, other intelligence agencies in the U.S., which were joined under the National Security Council, which exists to this day in in basically an unchanged form, National Security Council started directing new programs of surveillance uh, foremost amongst them, the first satellite r- surveillance project to come to fruition to surveil, yeah, China, Russia, and Indonesia. And th- that was called Corona, right? From Corona. And it was actually this ingenious program of sending cameras and film to space and then ejecting capsules of telescopic films back to Earth and then collecting them and developing them just in old school black and white and with r- amazing precision. And, and it, it really led the the CIA especially to become incredibly paranoid about Southeast Asia. They couldn't see what was going on in Southeast Asia because of all the clouds the satellite camera was dealing with. But when they could, they realized the masses, the millions of people that lived in rural Southeast Asia and how they came to believe basically all of them were communists, many millions of people, and all of them were intent on rejecting any Western influence. All of these things were wrong, but it is true that Indonesia had a million members in their communist party. And eventually it, it spurred the CIA to make a number of really bad decisions. And the way that they went about about these really bad decisions in terms of covert wars against governments that didn't support the West. Is so, pattern, so car, like, so- like Sukarno, exactly, who had the conference of, of Bandung bringing all the non-aligned nations together, trying to create uh, an alternative to this w- Western communist geopolitical alliance during the height of the Cold War. The way they started attacking these governments with covert wars was both completely ineffective and repeated all the way from Vietnam to Afghanistan to Iraq to possibly even Ukraine today. Uh, although the, it's not, you can't really call Ukraine a, a covert war, but it was both repeated. But in the end, the, they were able to get a lot of what the National Security Council wanted, which was in this case, yeah, the fall of the, the Sukarno Republic, uh, uh, a republic that was trying to balance in the human, humanitarian socialism, kind of mm-hmm. balance the competing interests of the capitalist plantation owners, the peasant workers, the urban kind of poor of Indonesia. And they, the CIA did so to start by, yeah, smuggling weapons to like small, unpopular, like pro-West 
factions of the army. And this played out exactly in Cassiavera and all the volcano as it did across Indonesia, where kind of popular sentiment was against these Im imperialist arms, uh, um, these imperialist intrusions, and they were all easily defeated. But by creating the surveillance state, both through the satellites and also on the ground, the CIA was able to contribute to, to creating lists of people and their political alignments. And these eventually became hit lists, murder lists by the New Order regime of who to wipe out. And yeah, some estimates say as many as a million people were killed in a two-year program directed mostly against the communists. And then, of course, yeah, land defenders, other radicals, artists, historians, intellectuals, um, yeah, play out just in a tragic almost farce at this point over and over with the CIA. But one of the first places they deployed it and came up with what, yeah, Bevins calls it in his book quite brilliantly, the Jakarta method was then repeated across the world. But yeah, we have a lot to gain about how to resist, disrupt, dismantle this intelligence apparatus that's only become significantly stronger. I've been doing some research recently looking at the mobility of activists through time in Indonesia and their ability to organize international movements. There was a time where someone like Tan Malaka, one of the great like communist leaders and theoreticians, like equivalent in time and also like importance as like someone like Gramsci, Antonio Gramsci, Tan Malaka is from Sumatra. There was a time he could organize at, at the international communist international meetings like across Europe and Shanghai and China, where today a similar, even just a left leaning land activist has trouble crossing borders to attend like conferences. So we really need to think through the challenges of the surveillance state as they present to like international solidarity organizing in, in a much more serious way today than ever. But yeah, sir. Um, yeah, we get we gain some real insights, like from my book and from some recent work that's been happening, like specifically Brad Simpson. He's getting newer de declassified uh, materials, still much of the CIA's direct and the embassy's direct control of Indonesian society from the, the 50s to the present day is classified. And we don't have a strong understanding of just how directly the CIA and other agencies are operating. David Price just came out with a, a new book looking at the role of the CIA and in the big foundations in the world, Asia Foundation, Four Foundation. Mm -hmm. And that's new understanding as well. And now we, we've always known, but now we really understand the, the vital role that these foundations played in extending imperialism and colonialism into Southeast Asia and maintaining it for hundreds of years, all the way up until the 60s. His story kind of ends at a certain point with declassified materials, but we don't know the last 30, 40 years of interventions, we, we really don't have much on. But yeah, the, here we are like wondering about the connections to Standing Rock and Tiger Swan, right? This counterintelligence that's funded by the CIA. And we understand some of the same groups that have been involved in repressing that indigenous land back movement are actually at, at play in the plantation lands across Sumatra, Kalimantan, Papua. So um, some of the same Tiger Swan specifically is involved? I, well, in I think there's an indirect link or maybe more direct than I can say, but I do know that some of the same people that are invi were involved with Tiger Swan were involved with the Black Rock group from mm -hmm. the from Iraq, and some of that group has been operating Eric Eric, 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 Pr Eric Prince's company. Yeah. yeah, Eric. Yeah, we have just Black Water. Black Rock's the thank um, you. <laughs> Black Rock is the asset manager. Yeah, and now I've merged hedge fund finance capital like into the violence of this imperialism, but it's real. I think like some of the work that like the Intercept has been doing on surveillance, like, it's just so vital for us to think about organizing. In a, of course, there's been like a lot about like digital security culture, but I think that we, there's more strategic and more sophisticated like tools activists could think through and. Also just getting a lot better about what is just in-person conversation and what, how vital is that to organizing versus the electronic platforms. We also see like the real limits of it, I think, with some of the in insurgencies around the world. I'm just like, I'm really trying to learn more about Rojava right now. Now it's 10 <clears throat> years, women's led, armed an anarchists don't call it a nation state, but they're creating their own place in a really in a place where no one thought that could be possible, like a woman's led armed co commune based non capitalist society emerging like from within the Kurdistan, that border of Syria and Iraq and Turkey and all that. And yeah, I'm really just amazed by how effective they've been by just completely offline organizing and building 
a really strong like international solidarity network that includes now like research institutes into in, into like issues of, of th that pertain to them in a number of places in Europe mm -hmm. uh, and just how much they've done to create like a solidarity economy, a care economy within that place as well. So these are the issues that I think that all of us as like activists are, are, are always interested in and always can learn more about. You're moving into my sort of, I have two last questions and you're moving into the second to the last one, which is around the Cassia Vera mobilization, offering a blueprint for other movements. We're getting into other movements, but do you think there are parts of their story that are, are really relevant to similar situations around the world? Yeah. We've touched on it all a little bit, just wanting to hear if there's any concise thoughts on that. Yeah. We know from organizing that you can't just do a one size all that would be like taking exactly what they did and trying to apply it to somewhere else would be like the same fallacy that like our capitalist world does about like industrial agriculture, where you could just apply it, but we can be reminded that Cassio Vera inform informs other movements in a really important way, like what we've been talking about today. And it really attests to this idea that this colonial and capitalist dispossession or this whole form of economy and a way of relating to the world is a flawed enterprise. And it Cassio Vera shows us like one way of going beyond a lot of those problems and like the, the most clear way of thinking about it. And it's about reorganizing our relation to land and to work and to like food production, most pertinently with Cassio Vera and all they've done with their food forests. Like they have the on this barren like industrial land of like tobacco cropping. Now, 30 years later, they've created like a forest canopy of like food trees, avocado, um, chocolate, orange, clove, cinnamon, it, and, and all these crops bring them like great economic wealth, actually. Like many people there now are going from being coolies to like sending the next generation to college, to some universities. And all of those things really, you know, can, can inspire us and allow us to create more dialogue around how to extend these types of solutions to California, to the Bay, to land back movements in Canada. And I think that we need to appreciate the nuance and like the local and the specific. But if anything, I feel like there's like a great need for us to really like think of, okay, you know, it, it yeah, it, it can't only be on like the level of the non-material. Let's talk mm -hmm. much more fundamentally about like intersectionality with the economy, with women's rights, with L LGBTQ people's rights. And let's put that all the way down into the land or into the digital economy. So yeah, th those are the things that I think that Cassia Vera really helps us understand for sure. My last question is a current events question is we have a new president, which has been elected in Indonesia. I think he's going to take power in October. Uh, Prabowo Subianto, who was actually, like you said, a protege of Saharto, is also a general over special forces units. He's Timor and Acha and, and other places. You know, how do you think Proboa coming into power will affect the movement and Cassia Vera specifically. Yeah, in many ways, Proboa is like more dangerous and for me, like scarier than Trump. And that that's that's a huge thing to say because of the dangers like Trump has presented to our country. Proboa is someone that has just shown in his own history like a great capacity and for violence and you know, it's safe to say that like the land movements in Indonesia are in a bit of a an ebb right now. If you think about social movements as a tide going in and out and the level of the tide might be rising or might be falling over like longer time periods, but it's just like an ebb in the tide right now in Indonesia. So I think a lot of people are waiting and seeing and, and hoping that like the institutions that do exist to limit his power work. But I don't think, I think people are quite concerned. We see this rising rural, especially rural-based authoritarian populism across the world, um, mm -hmm. of course, like in our country, front and center. And we also have to remember that Proboa, as with Trump, as with someone like Bolsonaro in Brazil, uh, they play on this like rural populismo, this populist like vision of and supporting the countryside, these places that have been overlooked by like finance capitalism over the last few decades. But their strongest support is within these urban rich elites. And that just can laser focus our strategy, I think, on both uplifting the rural. Cassia Vera gives us a whole rural agrarian cosmology, as I like to talk about, a way of thinking about rural places 
in a really beautiful emancipatory way. We need that to counter these guys, and they all are guys, right? Basically, the fascists, right. the right. fascists. But we also need that strategic political class analysis that reminds us that no, it's these elites that are really supporting and getting these folks over the finish line. So how are we t- attacking capital and like? How are we redistributing power in a more autonomous way? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it there. I think that's a good way to, that's a good question to end on today. Folks, we've been talking with David Gilbert, who's an environmental anthropologist and author of a new book, Countering Dispossession, Reclaiming Land, a social movement, ethnography. If you're on video, you can maybe see it through my blur. David, thanks for joining me today. Uh, Folks, if you like what you're hearing, please check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. If you are watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. If you're listening to us on one of the many audio platforms we're on, please give us a rate and review. And then also, if you really like us, go to greenredpodcast.org and hit the support button or go to our Patreon at patreon.com backslash greenredpodcast and become a supporter of the Green Red Podcast. David, it's been great talking with you today and catching up with you. This is actually really vital, important work and something that we like to talk about in the Green and Red podcast. So thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for including me in your conversations. And before we wanted to close, I just wanted to give a thanks to Surya Wiran, the artist that you featured on the cover of the book, an incredible social movement artist and anarchist from Indonesia, who's been at the forefront of many of these protests we're talking about today for three decades. Also to the community of Casa Vera, and the indig- indigenous and peasant movement that are, whose story is included in there today. Thank you for allowing me to speak about your histories. want to recognize that I think both of us recorded this from Ohlone lands, unceded territories who are leading the land back movement. And please do reach out, connect with me. And I, I look forward to keep building with you, Scott, for sure. Yeah. And I also want to say, if you want to get a copy of the book, you can go to David's website, uh, amongst many other places to get it, uh, which is davidgilbert.com. And we'll put that into the show notes. That's the right website. Thanks so much. Yeah, it's um, David E. Gilbert, just because Sorry. I have the most common white settler name of all time. <laughs> I have to include the initial to get the the website domain. But yeah, you can get it from the University of California press website or any of your major book retailers. And yeah. There's also another famous David Gilbert, radical David Gilbert, which people may confuse you with. It, it wouldn't be the first time, and he's certainly my namesake, and big up to David Gilbert, who is now free, no longer yeah. incarcerated after many decades. Until we speak again, everyone else out there make trouble and misbehave, and we'll talk to you again soon.